The current global political atmosphere is steeped in fear of an intense rhetoric about political violence and terrorism. And amidst this turbulent environment, it's clear that scholars and practitioners need to get beyond the manufactured fear and the hysterical rhetoric peddled by what we call the corporate state military media complex, or simply what we call the power complex, and instead seek a deeper understanding of political groups that defend or deploy the tactics of economic sabotage, which is property destruction, or armed struggle in order to change repressive and violent social structures. So what I'm basically going to talk to you about today is the importance of dialoguing with terrorists. Why it's important. Those groups that have been, we'll talk about who gets to name who the terrorists are and, and who gets to claim that they're not in, throughout my talk, but the importance of, if we want to create a true culture of peace, sitting down and dialoguing with those whom gover many governments would refuse to dialogue with. We can't get anywhere with a refusal of dialogue if we want to eliminate the culture of violence and move towards a culture of peace. Such understanding is important to slow down and reverse the current trend among legislative and policy-making bodies and political leaders who increasingly marginalize, demonize, and exclude radical opposition groups from arenas of debate. Law enforcement agencies and so-called counter-terrorism experts around the world see no alternative to fierce repression of dissenting groups, but this approach typically backfires, producing even more resistance in multiplying the very tactics it seeks to eliminate. So that while, of course, law enforcement agencies, from their perspective, need to address groups using illegal tactics as criminals, they need not always vilify them as terrorists. They may be patriots, they may be populists, or they may be advocates of just causes, or maybe they're not. But they should attempt at least to understand the motivations and arguments of people advocating radical social change. Similarly, Western capitalist states, the US above all, should refrain from a visceral, unreflective, and politically motivated demonization of governments or groups opposed to their policies as terrorists if they wish to minimize rather than exacerbate tensions and threats by attempting negotiations with dissidents, opponents, and enemies before using violence, before waging warfare, before violating human rights. In addition, citizens and people everywhere should critically consider the complex histories, social conditions, and numerous points of view that underlie conflicts rather than blindly accepting what their governments and media report as truth. The heightened state repression we've experienced here in the United States since September the 11th, 2001, has led government and law enforcement to identify a wide range of nonviolent U.S. activists as terrorists. Without question, some radical groups, such as the Animal Liberation Front and the Earth Liberation Front, do not comprise or negotiate with their opposition. Corporate exploiters of animals, for instance. And they advocate and or use illegal tactics, such as sabotage. Nonetheless, it's a hasty move to equate smashing the windows of a first door with terrorism and with violence, with flying fully loaded passenger jet planes into the World Trade Center to create that kind of false equivalence. But such is the crudeness and such is the hysteria one finds routinely in the reactions of corporations, the state, mass media, and much of the public as well. Moreover, one must understand that militant resistance inevitably emerges within exploitative and repressive capitalist societies which make the achievement of democracy and justice difficult, if not impossible. As the saying goes, no justice, no peace. 
The so-called war on terrorism is more accurately viewed as a war against those who threaten the interests of transnational corporate domination and the neocon quest for world empire. This phony, duplicitous, Orwellian phrase has meaning only as a smokescreen for transnational corporations and the transnational capitalist class to gain control over oil markets and world resources in general while crushing anyone who dares to oppose the exploitation of animals, of people, and of the earth, or who oppose U.S. global military establishment with its black sites, espionage bases, secret military bases, and the 725 bases worldwide listed by the military. Those are just the ones that are listed by the military. After 9-11, the war on terrorism provided the perfect cover for a war on democracy in the form of government, corporate, and law enforcement attacks on civil liberties, free speech, and domestic dissent of virtually all kinds. And while flags waved everywhere in a mindless jingoism oblivious to the real cause of 9-11, i.e. predatory transnational capitalism, U.S. support of <coughs> dictatorships throughout the Middle East, U.S. military bases in Saudi Arabia, and we could go on and on and on. The Bush administration was gutting freedoms, shredding the Constitution, and moving the U.S. ever closer to tyranny. But the state's tactic can only backfire, for if every dissenting group is branded as terrorists, then none are terrorists. And the true terrorists, those who use physical violence against innocents or non-combatants for political gain, those are the true terrorists, become harder to identify. As U.S. policy has failed miserably in Afghanistan and Iraq, with chaos, anti-American hostilities, soldier casualties, public opposition, and foreign terrorist threats growing, and while the nation's ports, railways, subways, airlines, and nuclear power plants remain vulnerable to attack, the government nonetheless squanders massive resources to persecute dissenting political groups and so-called domestic terrorist networks. Students, community activists, Quakers, food not bombs, PETA, Greenpeace, professors vocally critical of the Bush administration or supportive of the Cuban Revolution or Hugo Chavez's Bolivarian Revolution in Venezuela, and even people in vegetarian groups have been surveyed, have been harassed, prosecuted, arrested, jailed, and smeared as violent and demonized as terrorists. We note that peacemaking is based on working and dialoguing with radicals and militants, a point which many academics, government, and law enforcement agencies so easily forget. We wish to show that revolutionaries often, often, not always, not always, but often have legitimate goals, needs, and demands, which, if not addressed and respected, can prompt them to commit extreme or even more violent acts. Peacemaking, critical pedagogy, pedagogy is simply another word for education. Oh, it really means more, but I won't get into the semantic breakdown. But critical pedagogy, critical education. And conflict studies provide a salient literature through which to explore this topic. We argue that conflict transformation is not something we simply adventitiously choose to do when engaging in peacemaking. Rather, it must be broached with everyone, everyone in conflict situations, especially if they involve or can lead to violent struggles. <clears throat> so I'm going to begin with a brief sketch of the current sociopolitical climate in the United States and show how the Bush administration's policy hindered efforts to negotiate or reduce conflict with individuals and groups that are, on their skewed definitions, radical, violent, or terrorist. Then I'll attempt to explain the deception and hypocrisy of the war on terrorism and examine the complexity of the whole notion of terrorism as a concept. <clears throat> 